Talks with Terry, and this morning uh, I'm very fortunate and happy to have Thank Newport you. Mental Health, uh, and we'll have an important co community conversation here. Um, I want everybody to know that this meeting is going to be recorded and it will be shared on social media. So I think, uh, given the topic, that we should all be mindful of sharing personal information. We should be we should be careful about that. And um, with that, I, I want to thank uh, Edward McPherson for helping me to, to help assemble uh, this panel together. And um, I would like to, with that, I'll introduce the panel. And this morning we have Daniel Wartenberg, and I'll let you all each talk about what your role is. So why don't we kick it off with you, Dan, and then we'll just go around and I'll give each of the uh, panel uh, opportunity. Okay. Uh, thanks, Terry. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dan Wartenberg, and I'm the clinical director here at Newport Mental Health, uh, the community mental health center um, on the island. I, and in that role, I oversee the operation of all of our our clinical programs. Um, I don't know, Tara, if you want me to sort of go into more about what we do well, at this point, or just in, stick we'll with the We'll come back. Yeah, well, let's just do the introductions right now. Um, also, we're happy to have Rebecca Elwell. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'm Rebecca Elwell. I'm the director at Newport County Prevention Coalition um, and the director of the newly founded Strategic Prevention Partnerships, which is our 501c3. Um, very happy to be here as part of this conversation today, especially to highlight our um, Newport County No Wrong Door system of care. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Uh, Michelle Brophy, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Brophy. I'm with the Department of Behavioral Health Care, Developmental Disabilities and Hospitals, or BHDDH. And Jamie Lahane asked me to join today because I also chair the continuum of care for the state, which is the policy and planning body for homelessness and supportive housing. So thank you for having me. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. And uh, Linda Hurley. Good morning. Good morning. And um, my name is Linda Hurley. I work with Kodak Behavioral Healthcare. Uh, we've been in Newport for, I believe, 42 years now. Uh, primarily providing care relative to substance use disorder, opioid use disorder, but as well as a wide range of behavioral health care services. I'm the president and CEO of Kodak. Um, and I think that uh, it's so important to thank Rebecca, thank you, Terry, for this conversation. I know that uh, Jamie Lahane and I, as well as Dr. John Brett, who many know, have been talking about a no wrong door structure for many, many years. And we're so excited to have Rebecca in the lead and, um, and you know the Van Buren group and everyone for supporting us in this. So thank you. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, uh, Ed McPherson, who I can't see, but I, he's definitely here. I think he's here. <laughs> Ed, you're a little broken up. Oh, okay. Well, with that, uh, so who wants to kick us off this morning? Uh, would that be you, Dan, or is there somebody else that wants to start off the conversation? Sure, I, I can start. Um, and let me, um, so I, I missed our little introduction. But um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we do um, and, and just a second on, and then sort of segue, I think, into Rebecca and how that sort of feeds into the No Wrong Door project. Um, so we are um, what's called the Community Mental Health Center. And as, and as that implies, we are here to meet the mental health needs of the community of greater Newport County, um, which entails a lot of things. So we have a number of programs that um, range in scale from your sort of traditional outpatient therapies, things like medications and therapies, to more intensive services, which include things like 
helping people with employment, peer-related services, nursing, doctors, um, more intent to help people with more acute needs. We're founded on a, some core principles. So one is we take what's called a recovery-oriented uh, approach to care. So what does that mean? So what that means first and foremost is that we believe that people do and can get better. Um, that this, even though some of these illnesses are um, very severe and debilitating, we have worked with a number of people who have improved, and we believe it, and we convey that to the people that we work with. We also believe that the work we do is more than just about treating somebody's symptoms. So you can come in and alleviate specific symptoms, but we, we are about helping people to live a life that's worth living. And that often means more than just direct treatment of the symptoms. So we, again, we'll help people with housing, with employment, um, with social relations, and sort of wrap those services around folks. Um, we are also based on the principle of rapid access. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, many people in the community who struggle with a, a mental illness, it often takes them a long time to decide to get help. It's not an easy thing to do. And they may um, suffer for weeks or for months before they actually even decide to call you or walk in the door. Um, you need to be ready when that moment comes to be able to respond to them. Because if you're not, they may not, that day may pass and they may decide, you know, nah, no, it wasn't such a good idea. So to do that, you really need to be set up to have rapid access to care. So in that moment that somebody decides they want your help, you gotta be there, okay? And that has a lot of implications for care. Okay, so one of them being is just how you set up your services, and um, you know we have an immediate access program, which you know COVID threw a wrench in, um, but we've adapted it, which is basically come on in, okay? Because I think in your traditional services, somebody would call and say, oh, you have an appointment in three weeks or four weeks or even a week, and that's often too long for people. Um, you have to strike while the iron is hot. Huh. The other thing I want to say, and just to transition, is we can't, it not, none of us can be everything to everybody, even though we would like to be. Okay? So we also, we serve people across the lifespan. We, we work with people with a number of different conditions, but we don't have the resources or the expertise to provide every service to every person. And I think that's where this network of care and the no wrong door comes in. So, you know, through the generosity of the Van Buren Foundation, we've been able to work with Rebecca and other members of this panel to create this system where no matter where somebody walks in, that same sort of rapid access that we're talking about exists between the agencies as well, okay? Um, it's certainly a work in progress. And let me just add one more thing and then I'll, <laughs> I'll move on. The other piece that we're adding, so my, I'm actually taking on a new role at the agency here. We were just a, awarded a grant from, from SAMHSA, from the federal government, um, to do suicide prevention. Excellent. So I think everybody is aware that um, the rising rates of suicide, both nationally and in Rhode Island, and the devastating impact it can have on, on everybody. It's, it's the most extreme case of what um, a mental illness can do to somebody. We've been awarding this grant and are adopting this uh, methodology that has been used across the country. It's called a zero suicide methodology. And our training 
Um, there are five partner agencies that are participating in this. Again, it's sort of I mentioned it in the context of the system of care. So it's ourselves, Kodak, um, EBCAP, uh, the Women's Resource Center. Um, oh boy, and I'm, who am I forgetting? And oh, and Newport Hospital. <laughs> and we are try building it into the system of care. So one of the things. Uh, just I'll throw one fact that, that just shook me. So we went through a training last week with these of uh, the Zero Suicide Institute, and the, there's the percentage of people that commit suicide who actually were in some kind of care in the prior month is staggering. It's very significant, particularly if you include primary care visits, it is as much as, depending on the study, 60% had a contact with somebody in the month prior to actually committing suicide wow. and then somehow got lost to the system. So one of the things we're looking through this, through the combination of the no wrong door and this, I'm going to call it the zero suicide initiative because that's our goal, um, is to sort of tighten up all those spaces between the agency to make sure that nobody gets lost. Falls through the cracks, right? Great. Great. Okay. So let me, so I, can, okay. I can talk forever, but so let okay. me stop there. So um, who is appropriate to, to explain, Rebecca, would you like to explain your role in this, how this new initiative is going to work? You're muted, though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was muted because I had barking dogs in the back. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate Dan's setup. Um, he really did a great job explaining uh, sort of that infrastructure behind No Wrong Door. Um, I, I'll back up a step and say um, that the Prevention Coalition really was established to focus on primary prevention, which means intervening at a point before disease starts or before addiction starts or before um, particularly young people start down a path um, where their lives may be impacted either by high risk behaviors or again addiction or mental health issues. Um, and so that's sort of where we enter into the scene. We're not a treatment provider, we're a prevention provider. In having conversations over years with particularly with parents or with individuals with loved ones who were struggling to find treatment resources, it appeared that in Newport County, we just really didn't have many services. Digging a little bit more deeply, we have abundant resources here in Newport County, really high quality behavioral health care services. So where was the disconnect? And part of the disconnect was People just don't know how to access those services many times. And if they do have, maybe they know Newport Mental Health because it's very recognizable. Newport Mental Health may not have been able to provide what they needed. So there was a level of frustration. And if you're a family in crisis, you don't wanna be put off and told, oh, you know, you need to call so-and-so or, we don't provide that service, maybe you can reach out to another agency. And so all good, well-meaning um, responses, but people in struggle are not able to necessarily follow up on those best recommendations. So enter the conversation that I walked into with Jamie Lehane from Newport Mental Health, Linda Hurley from Kodak, John Brett from Newport Hospital, that conversation about how do they engage each other more closely so that if somebody walks through any door to get behavioral health services in Newport County, they will be connected to the most appropriate level and type of service. Um, so we were really fortunate at Newport County Prevention to be able to be part of that table, that discussion, which led to um, the recognition that we needed to resource that project in a way. So we needed some funding and we needed some staffing to help keep that ball rolling. Um, we're very fortunate to receive um, over three years, a $375,000 grant from the Van Buren Foundation, um, as well as a $30,000 grant from the Grubin Foundation to um, work on building this infrastructure. So as Dan mentioned, 
no wrong door really comes from the spirit of no matter which agency you might enter among the, we have approximately nine partners now, Newport Mental Health, Kodak, Child and Family, um, Newport Hospital, EBCAP, Trinity, I don't wanna leave anybody out, Women's Resource Center, Hope Recovery, and um, Boys Town of New England all come to the table with Newport um, Coalition, Newport County Coalition to sort of have those conversations to build that infrastructure to determine some best practices in terms of referrals from one agency to another, tighten up those gaps that people could pot potentially fall through so that it's, it's sort of a cliche expression now, that warm handoff. However, it's probably the best and most apt uh, way of describing so that if somebody walks in and are not able to get the appropriate care from one agency, that there is a physical movement from one agency to another so that that person doesn't walk away frustrated or unable to access the care that they need. Um, and that brings us pretty much to where we are right now. It was a year of uh, infrastructure building coming up with uh, the right protocols, um, which continues to this point, some software development so that we can track where people are at in their movement from one organization to another. Um, and now comes the really uh, rich dialogue around people who maybe have complex cases and are being seen by multiple agencies um, or those folks who are in the community that are getting good behavioral health care but may also need some of those wraparound services around housing and jobs and, and all of that. That will come a few steps down the road, but it's what we're really looking forward to because that's when our hands are really um, helping the lives of people to, en to enrich their experience. Um, so we're, we're looking forward to that transition. Great, thanks. So Michelle, could you talk to us about how your role at state level is interacting on this program? Sure. Um, so BHGDH actually oversees the continuum of services on the behavioral health and the developmental disability side from prevention to treatment to recovery. So all of the wonderful agencies that were just mentioned are, are part of our system um, on one end or the other. Um, our uh, director believes that housing and employment are actually the foundations for recovery and um, we're in the process of reorganizing to actually work across disabilities and um, focus more on the housing and the employment piece. Um, my interest is in housing. I have 25 years of being a homeless and supportive housing advocate. So I came to the state to try to make some, some changes and um, here I am. So I'm excited to be um, starting to work um, more on increasing access to housing. Um, in my role um, on, as the chair of the continuum of care, I've been working really closely with Jamie Lahane, um, especially during um, the pandemic. He's actually been incredible. And I would just say that Aquidneck Island in Newport County um, is, is so lucky to have someone like him with his background and expertise in the community who I think he was a one person homeless act team for a while at, at the motel. But we have um, in the state of Rhode Island, um, we receive funds, federal funds from the US Ho Department of Housing and Urban Development. And they require that communities have a continuum of care that works on planning and policy for homelessness. And um, in Rhode Island, we have only one continuum of care. And a lot of the, the individuals experiencing long-term homelessness are in Providence and like everything else, a lot of the services are in the, the metro areas. And, and we were really excited to work more closely with Newport County Community Mental Health Center because we've been kind of lacking on our continuum of care side, um, access to um, the, the mental health services and, and that are that are needed um, in that area, and I. It, it's our fault. I'm not. I'm not placing blame on anyone. It's just there's limited dollars to deal with homelessness, and again, because the majority of people are in the Providence area, we end up having like 
um, lack of capacity in Newport County, in Washington County, in Northern Rhode Island. So the funds that we receive from the federal government to, to work on our system are, aren't enough. So we need to see how we can pull in mainstream resources like the community mental health centers to kind of work on outreach. So we like to say that we want to functionally end homelessness. And when I say that, I mean, people can fall into homelessness, but we should have um, the solution, which is permanent supportive housing. So if someone falls into homelessness and they're out quickly. Um, they're in housing, they have the services they need to keep them housed. So in Newport County, you actually have the capacity to be the first community in the state to functionally end homelessness. You have the McKinney Shelter, there's 35 individuals currently there. We had to reduce numbers due to COVID because the number of people in one space um, wasn't allowable just because of the pandemic. And um, sorry, my screen just uh, timed out. Um, so, well, I'll just keep talking. You're good. <laughs> okay. I yes. can't see myself so. anymore. So anyways, I guess I would just say, um, Jamie, through the pandemic, has about 32 people that make up uh, 20 households that he's working with at the motel. He's been able to fundraise. We're bringing some of our continuum of care dollars to the organization to help move people, keep them in the hotel for now, but move them into permanent supportive housing. I know he's had articles in the paper where he has you know, reached out to local landlords and the public housing authorities to see if we could you know, get uh, the, the rental assistance needed for families to, to stay in Newport. We want individuals to stay in the area where they have connections, where they have services, where they have support systems. So, um, so I, I, I am just here to, you know, help again in any way I can, as far as, um, you know, looking at what the department can do to assist the agencies that we license or that we fund um, through prevention and recovery to um, whether it's, you know, uh, through policies and procedures and, and how we can streamline things. So we're here, we're a partner for you and anything um, that we can do as a community to reduce the numbers of homeless individuals. I, I have been told that right now there's um, not a specific outreach team um, because uh, Jamie has been able to serve people who are traditionally homeless on the street in the motel. But if that's not the case, I would love to know so we can try to work at targeting some some um, street outreach. Yeah, I think, let me just comment on, on that quickly because, you know, this all, you know, came up under COVID and like, you know, in, in, in rapid, uh, rapid fashion. And what we were able to do through the, you know, through the, really through the flexibility of, of Buddha is to sort of bring them into our ACT team, which is our most intensive team, and sort of perform the outreach work, you know, of a, a homeless outreach team under sort of the auspice and, and with the reimbursement um, through the ACT, which is the Assertive Community Treatment Team. So it was a temporary fix, so I'm, we're certainly not going to stop looking for funding to, you know, have a full-fledged homeless outreach team. You know, again, ja it, you know, Jamie's like a force of nature sometimes if he mm -hmm. uh, gets his sights on something and he, you know, the, the um, actually the emergency department from Newport Hospital reached out to us and say, hey, what are you going to Wait, what are you guys going to do um, with COVID? These folks are at risk. They're at risk of, you know, spreading the, um, you know, the virus to others. And we <laughs> took some rapid action to sort of stand up the, the hotel program. And it was pretty amazing. And again, with help from a lot of both philanthropic and state funding to make it happen. Great. Thanks. Linda, would you like to um, weigh in? on your organization's role? Absolutely. Um, at first, just again, I have to come back to thanking everyone. You know, 
I've, uh, I've been in the system for 33 years. Um, I've been with Kodak that long. And uh, most of that time or my original time was specifically in Newport County. Uh, of course, now we're across the state, but Newport is one of our home sites. And when I think back through the years, um, we used to work extremely closely. I was on the board of the McKinney Shelter. We had street outreach. We had a Broadway, Broadway initiative for homelessness, I think. And we had teams that would go out because speaking to what Michelle said, um, 15 years ago, there was such limited funding to begin with and it did go where it needed to go, which was Providence, you know, Pawtucket, Central Falls. So we tried to, you know, once again, the insular nature of the island, we tried to do everything ourselves. And um, my point of saying this is without including uh, prevention, treatment, recovery for behavioral health, all of those without including all of the entities that support that, as well as including um, BHDDH and the Department of Health and the entities that support us, it could not be sustainable. So I was sitting here listening and thinking about all the things we started that lasted two and a half years, lasted three years, and this is so exciting. you know. And, and I have to also say thank you for everyone. Jamie absolutely is a force. Um, as I said, we've been talking about the concept of no wrong door uh, for years. And so about two, I would say two to three years ago, um, John Brett and Jamie and I were talking about this once again. And um, with Jamie's energy, we've come such a long way. And then with Rebecca's remarkable creativity and organizational skills, um, it's, it's, it feels like a miracle to me from a historic perspective. So it's just a big old giant thank you <laughs> to all of my colleagues there. Um, so what Kodak, the history of Kodak, for those that don't know, is um, we were originally an organization who treated substance use disorder and opioid use disorder. We were one of the first in the country, actually, um, to have community OTP centers, opioid treatment program centers that provide medicine for substance use disorder. Uh, we're the oldest in the state. Uh, we've been doing it now, it'll be 50 years next year. And um, so, so we are known for that. However, Kodak, much like Newport Mental Health and EBCAP and other, and other entities um, has also learned that substance use disorder, what's called addiction does not live in a vacuum. You know, you don't, it's not like appendicitis where you go to the hospital, you get fixed surgically, you heal and it's done. This is a chronic relapsing disease of the brain. And that's from the American Medical Association 2011, chronic relapsing disease of the brain. It needs a continuum of support for all aspects of healing from this disease. In addition, it's remarkably complex. Anywhere from 40 to 80% of those that walk through the door at Newport Mental Health, closer to the 40 number, uh, have a diag diagnosable, if you will, substance use disorder, alcohol, cocaine, opioids. And the number of people that come to Kodak for substance use disorder is much higher. That's closer to the 60 to 80%. So we can no longer work in silos. And it's wonderful to have, and the key word here is collaboration. It's wonderful to take all of the expertise that is held in these nine agencies and be able to say, this is your strength, your strength, your strength. Linda walks in with these pieces, um, we'll get her to you immediately. And again, I'll go back to warm handoff. We use, you know, that's language. We, you said it was cliche. We use it in, in grants all the time, but the reality is now we do hot handoffs. And that's, that's when I say three people are in the room, someone from Kodak, someone from Newport Mental Health and the individual that needs care. And it is, it's not, it's, and the transportation is taken care of. 
Um, one of the reasons that we had, and then I'll come back to the rest of what Kodak does, but I'm so excited about this, uh, this initiative. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we brought to the table from a historic perspective, we used to laugh because Kodak is only, I believe, five blocks from Newport Hospital. And even with a paid taxi ride, individuals get, would get lost on Broadway. If you, if you know, if, it's because it's frightening, right? It's scary to go to a new place. It's scary to find, you know, okay, now I have to go there, tell them my insurance information all over, or tell them I don't have insurance. Uh, I just don't want to do this. And so I walk off to Friendship Street or something. <laughs> so, so um, you know, we used, to, we used to say, how are we going to do this, you know? Uh, and then when the HOPE initiative came, we met with them and we thought, well, maybe a peer could walk people or drive folks. So having this be organized under a large umbrella with the support of Van Buren and Gluben with the, Rebecca's wonderful oversight is really a gift. Right? So right. back to Kodak and what we do. <laughs> Um, so over the years, we provide services for adults, uh, adolescents, uh, and these services are basically anything under, at this point, anything that falls under our mission to assist people in healing from this disease and support their recovery. Uh, we provide mental health treatment and psychiatric care, but we provide mental health treatment and psychiatric care um, for those whose medication is working, they're not at high risk. The second that anybody is risky, we make that hot handoff to Newport Mental Health. Um, it's smooth. You know, uh, we have worked historically with EBCAP relative to um, primary care. And because our patients are so hesitant to go, and the patients that come to us with substance use disorder, or co-occurring disorders. They also have multiple comorbidities. They haven't, you know, when you have these diseases, it's, it's hard to take care of yourself. And so they have multiple, multiple other physical illnesses and truly do need medical care and are often uh, unwilling uh, to share their history of substance use disorder because of shame and stigma. So Kodak has begun to do medical treatment um, we're, not, we're not looking to move into anybody's territory, so to speak, just for our patients and the patients at Newport Mental Health that have difficulty with internal resources, getting their medical needs met. You know, it can be a young person that doesn't feel like they're sick, suddenly they're sick, they don't know how to access primary care. It can be someone who has had um, experiences that they perceive to be um, difficult in accessing primary care. And so, so we're very excited about that. Currently we provide treatment for folks with um, uh, uh, infectious diseases like hepatitis C. Uh, you know, we're, we're very close with ACOS for providing services for HIV, um, high blood pressure, um, reproductive health, all the things that the folks that come to us for care say, this is what I need. So these are the trends. Um, and we do a great deal of family consultation because these, you know, the disease, opioid use disorder is an epidemic. It's through the roof, right? Um, so everybody from every walk of life comes to our doors and we want to let people know that they can do that. Just because you're coming to Kodak on Thames Street doesn't mean that you need to take medicine. You might not need buprenorphine or Vivitrol or methadone. We can get you what you need. All you have to do is come through the door or even pick up the phone. You know, mom, grandma, worried about somebody in the family. That's what we do, just as all the other members do as well. Uh, in terms of COVID, in terms of COVID, we have mitigated uh, exposure in many ways through regulatory waivers and using a great deal of telehealth to provide support and case management. And um, so that's pretty much who we are. We have uh, eight sites in the state now. We're about to open one in Kent County as well. Um, so that if somebody is in Newport and they need to work in Providence, you know, we can, we can work with folks. Uh, and 
I guess, and lastly, uh, I've heard a term recently and I don't usually like it when science makes up words, um, but having an opioid epidemic in the middle of a pandemic, these, there's a synergistic effect. I read last night, uh, NIH, actually National Institute of Health, that suicide rates are higher yesterday than they have been since the Great Depression. That jumped out at me as well. So we have folks with a disease that requires support and connection who are being told to isolate, which is the antithesis of healing from this disease. So it's, it's, been, it's, it's a very critical time. And so the pandemic increases stressors, which synergistically impact somebody's ability to stay in recovery and uh, you know, someone's history of substance use disorder and other mental health conditions leaves them vulnerable to the stressors of the pandemic, both physically and emotionally. So never has there been a time when we need to work collaboratively than right this moment. Uh, and because then you sprinkle on civil unrest and none of us are comfortable right now. It's a hard time, that's a hard time. For, for everyone, I think. So particularly people that are vulnerable and have, have other issues that they're dealing with. Thank you, Linda. So I, I wanted to, I have a few questions that have been pre-submitted and then I wanted to open it up to all of you who um, I'm grateful have joined us today so that we can have a conversation. Um, one question uh, that uh, is a a question as a state rep, I have gotten a couple calls recently about people that were in instances of homelessness. Who, who should I call in from your all's opinion? I, I, I have called EPCAP, I've called uh, Child and Family Services, but um, who is the right person to call if somebody, if I have somebody on the line that I am concerned about that says they need help? Where do I go? So in Rhode Island, um, we have through the continuum of care, what they call a coordinated entry system. And it's, it's something that's new, they're, they're working. But if somebody is experiencing homelessness, the way to um, move them through the system from shelter through permanent supportive housing would be the coordinated entry system. Um, and I guess I would just say, because we, don't have enough affordable and supportive housing funds in the state of Rhode Island, sometimes there, there is a wait, but that's the way to get into the system. Now, of course, I, I'm gonna just walk over here to get the number for you, sorry. I should have had that. <laughs> so the number for the coordinated entry system is 277-4316. People have any issues with that system? Again, we're in the process of um, an RFP through the um, Office of Housing and Community Development. You can always connect with me, and I can do my best to to okay. any issues you may have. But that's that's the starting point. I think by the time they get to me, they're like desperate, and so some of yeah. these other factors of you know. Um, that might be related to mental health, but you know, I was able to observe over the phone um, talking to people, and it made me. And you know, and I would, um, I would add, Terry. You know, we have our twenty-four hour access number, so even if we're not, again, the endpoint of services, yeah. I would always uh, encourage people to to call us, and we will, you know, we will help to route them. At, um, somewhere they need to get if it if we're not going to bring them in and try to engage them ourselves what's, so what's that 24 so hour hot number hotline number? it is it's 401-846-1213 that's you. our main number so it you know it'll get into you know right into one of our facilities during the day and then off hours there's um 24 7 clinician um, manning that service to talk to anybody that comes on. Okay. I, I also, I didn't mention before, we also have, as part of our emergency services, up till approximately 12 or 1 in the morning now, the capacity to do 
what's called mobile response. So we have clinicians um, embedded with the local police department. So if somebody actually needs an on-site visit after hours, we have the capacity to do that. Okay, good to know. Thank you, thank you. So I know we have a lot of people on the line that are involved with uh, the various prevention coalitions in the schools. Did um, do you does somebody have a question? Does somebody want to field? Um, let's see. I think um, I think is Sandy. Are you still on the line, Sandy Ox? You submitted a question, and I wanted to know if you wanted to ask it yourself. She was asking about. Are you there? Is Sandy still on the line? Okay. Well, she had asked earlier, just to open up the questions, um, what's being done in the schools in the area to provide more counseling? Can, does anybody want to take a stab at that question? So I could take a, a piece and then I, I see Laura Clark on the line. Hi, Laura. Oh. <laughs> uh, also, was, okay. um, one of the schools. So we... Um, we have in two of the school systems in Portsmouth and Newport um, embedded clinicians just to sort of supplement and try to pick up the need. Now, again, that has been very much disrupted with COVID in and the, the schools, like the hospitals, are very careful about who they're actually letting into the schools, who's not actually a member or employed by the school system. So we're kind of working our way back into the systems to have an on-site presence. So that is to work in conjunction with the staff of the school, and I pointed to Laura because I know that she's doing that in Middletown, um, to sort of supplement and provide some immediate access to students who need help. Um, the, the other thing that's, you know, sort of complicated it now is this sort of mix of homeschool, you know, remote learning and on-site learning and the impact that's having both on the kids and on the families. So th there's, a, there's a cycle usually to when people start to come in, when the kids start to come in for mental health services and it's usually about now, which is like a month into the school year. There's, there's usually a little honeymoon period at the beginning of the year, and then problems start to arise. And about this time of year, things really start to pick up, which is happening even more so. But we're, we're actually getting more sort of calls from parents because on top of every other stressor that we talked about, about insecurity about so employment and insecurity about am I or my family going to catch this virus? It's like I'm trying to do my work at home and I have to uh, help my kid to, you know, get schooled. And it's just the, the stressors are, are, are really significant. So we're seeing it pick up. Um, and, again, we have, you know, we have both our services on site here at Newport Mental Health. And I, and I should say that if, we're doing that right now at this point in the pandemic as a combination of remote telehealth and on-site. Okay. So. Great. Terry, um, I'd like to just yes. chime in. Oops. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so we also have student assistance counselors in the schools at the high school and middle school levels. Um, and that's been an issue for years in terms of how is that funded? And yes. because it's not a Rhode Island Department of Education mandated position, it's always one of the first things on the chopping block when um, communities yeah. are looking to balance their budgets. So in each of the communities right now, uh, with the exception of Little Compton, there is uh, student assistance counselors, middle and high school. Um, none of them are full-time. Uh, they're all uh, sort of piecemeal paid for by the towns, by the coalition, and some um, funding that comes through the state from the federal block grant. Um, one of the problematic issues for prevention in general, but also for student assistance, is that there are no state dollars that are paying for 
student assistance or any prevention services. All of our funding, even if it comes through BHDDH is coming from federal dollars. Um, so that takes a lot of the control away from how is this gonna get funded? Um, I will speak specifically to Tiverton. Tiverton gets no uh, state or federal funding for their student assistance. So it's balanced out by the school department and the coalition. So what happens like in a year like this year where the budgets for the school departments are so problematic, um, that position was cut. Um, it went from a five-day position to a four-day position just at the same moment where we're seeing the challenges that, that young people are facing on the rise and the challenge of even reaching them because of the hybrid in school, out of school. It's, it's more time consuming to even get to kids. It's not like you can walk down a hall and grab someone to meet with you. So uh, less time, more issues, less money, um, so that's a challenge that we are always facing. Um, the student assistance position, um, all of our student assistance counselors are through Rhode Island Student Assistance Services. Um, they do a phenomenal job. They are highly trained, specifically focused on um, substance abuse and mental health. They are um, all licensed. We get an enormous bang for the buck through them. Uh, we're very fortunate. They get great supervision through their agencies. And yet still in, at the community level, within the school level, there's some, oftentimes um, sort of the idea that, oh, well, we have guidance counselors. Guidance counselors can do that. And I just want to say that guidance counselors really could be re-termed academic advisors because they're not specifically trained to do some of this mental health um, and substance abuse prevention, early intervention and referral. That's where those student assistance counselors are absolutely in, uh, indispensable. They've got the training, they've got the resources. Um, and so I guess that's my, that's my plug for that position. Okay. <laughs> but until we get some sort of consistent funding, funding or at least a consistent way of, um, of keeping these folks on board, it's still always gonna be a challenge for us. What and I just want to support everything Rebecca just said. I'm better coming from you probably than me, but I, I definitely, if we could have a student assistance counselor in every school, I think um, we could do a lot more. We continue to look for federal grants, but they're um, not always available. So thank you for, for saying that, Rebecca. Thank you. Terry, may I add something here, please? Sure. Um, I think that... Um, talking about student assistance professionals, they're wonderful. Uh, one of the things with mental health and sometimes in particular substance use disorder, the um, parents know so little, it's so frightening to see. Um, and I wanted to add that Kodak also has a 24 seven number that when it isn't during our time that we're open, which can be up till eight o'clock at night, a nurse actually answers. Um, and I'm happy to give that number as well. Please. And that's 401-490-0716. Great. And from that call with a nurse, we have um, physicians on call. So that uh, even on the weekends, so mm -hmm. that um, if, if it looks like, I mean, clearly if somebody needs to be in the emergency room, they need to be in the emergency room or if they need to right. be at BH link, they need to be at BH link. Uh, but for those things in the middle, when parents are feeling lost uh, or when individuals are feeling lost, when a loved one may be under the influence or something is happening that's confusing, um, we have this availability. And then secondly, uh, I just wanted to add, and I'm sorry, but you do represent us, so I need to say this, <laughs> is that a lot of what we talk about, Terry, uh, again, it has to do, I'm old, you know, I've been, you know, it's decade after decade, budget after budget, you know, and, um, but we have got to start having the political will, and I know you're already there, but um, we've got to start having the political will to actually put in the state budget what it is we need to do to keep our residents safe relative to behavioral health. 
Because no sooner do we get a program up and running than a grant goes away. And there are no codes, no rates, no way to pay for 50% of what we're doing. So it has to go away because we have no money to pay for it. And when I say we, I'm talking behavioral health, yeah. not CODAC, yeah. across the board. And you also probably know if you read uh, Senator Miller's commission report on rates, uh, at least for substance use disorder and certainly for community mental health services, we are the lowest in New England. Mm. Um, our rates are horrendous. So okay. if we're looking at sustainability for all these projects, whether we're talking, you know, the social determinants, whether we're talking about, because we know work and housing is critical um, to any healing from anything, truly. Um, and if, if we can't get in there and do that, and if we're not paid adequately to do it, we're not gonna get the competence that we need. You know, if I'm paying somebody $15 an hour to do a job that they should be getting $22 for, they're driving to Taunton to do it. Right. And uh, right. so I, that's my plug. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, it seems you. like there's a lot of, it's like Rhode Island's like that in a lot of um, health um, support, um, for the oh, absolutely. Elderly, for the Ado, elderly, pediatrics, for the disabled, yes, yes. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I know we have a couple of people here from Middletown School Department. Do you want to weigh in, Laura, or do you have any comments or questions that you could share, add into this conversation? I'm in Newport. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in Thompson <laughs> Middle School. I okay. do have a question. I was just putting it in the chat. Hi, Linda. Um, is there a clearinghouse agency to like streamline access to the coalition? Yes. Good question. Got an answer? Is, is that part of your infrastructure that you're working on? <laughs> it is. So if I under, if I understand the question, um, you can outreach to Newport County prevention coalition um, by reaching out to me and that is um, 401-835-5311. 835, um, say it again. Eight, yep, sorry. 835-5311. Yeah. Okay. Or my, through my email, which is lwell, E-L-W-E-L-L -E -L -L, at riprevention.org. And if it's a, so that's for the regional coalition. And if you uh, reach out to me, I can link people up with their, also with their community coalition um, and also through the um, No Wrong Door system of care. Right. Um, and just, a, just an added piece to that. We know that um, adolescent and childhood issues are really um, of con great concern for people in the community. And it feels like we haven't been able to really wrap our hands around those issues at the moment, but that's on our radar screen. And uh, we're having a lot of side conversations about how to increase and strengthen that network. Um, we had to start somewhere. So we started with uh, sort of adult behavioral health um, because there were some critical issues that we needed to focus on there. Uh, but the conversation uh, keeps being brought up to us and we're very, well aware that uh, it's that adolescent piece uh, where people seem to be having the most challenge in getting supportive services. Well, actually, let me add one thing that we hopefully know um, in November, we'll be opening a brand new program, uh, which is called Healthy Transitions. It actually exists in a couple other places in the state, which is targeted for 16 to 25 year olds um, because we, we hear the same thing that 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 group, the particularly the older adolescents into young adult are are definitely um, they need a different service. You can't just sort of bring them into the adult services. So that's going to be an intensive team-based service um, that, um, like I said, should be operational uh, in the month of November. November. More to come. We're gonna we'll be publicizing that to the community once we get up and running. But it's targeted for people with significant um, behavioral health conditions, 
a lot of times sort of first break or first occurrence folks that if you can get them early on, you can really change their whole course of treatment. I'm, I'm sitting here at Thompson with um, Nate Rupames, who is our social worker here. Um, and what we're finding is for the kids who are doing the hybrid program in school and then distance learning, when they're in school, they're engaged, they're on it, they're operating with all cylinders. When they go home, it's crickets. Um, yeah. And I think that it's part of it is that's the only way they can express how upset they are with the system. It's the only way they can revolt. They're only hurting themselves. But I can see the frustration and they just, they just do not feel connected. That's, that's very so that's concerning. Our, that's challenge. I'll, I'll be quiet now, but that's our challenge is getting the kids who are doing distance learning um, right. connected feeling connected. Terry, yes. Linda, Linda has oh. a question. When you have a chance. Okay. Okay. And then I, I wanted to, I have a question. I wanted to see if Dennis Soares wanted to weigh in on this part of the conversation, but go ahead, Linda, and then we'll go over to Right. Dennis. Hi, I, I just, this is Linda Ujifuza and I'm on the Portsmouth Town Council. And I just wanted to thank Terry and all the speakers today for providing so much information before everyone hops off because the hour is up. I'm just wondering if um, there is a source where you can go to to get all the information, the numbers, you know, that we've been talking about today, um, because a lot of people won't be able to watch this and get it, draw it off from right. the video. But also, I know there's no wrong door, but there's so many doors that you've talked about. We, you know, it'd just be interesting uh, or informative. Let, to have Linda, we're, just so you know, because this conversation is so important, we actually um, gave it till 10. So um, we're not rushing right off, but um, but that's a great question. Um, and um, maybe we can, yeah, I was trying to think, maybe it would be good to have a place, even a, a web page or something where all this information's in one spot um, right. and for reference. Another question, I know, you know, when there's really an emergency, people dial 911. Um, yeah. If there's a super emergency on the mental health front, is that what people should do? If it's an, I would say if it if it's an imminent emergency and people are feeling that someone's you know in danger of harming themselves or someone else, I would still go to nine one one as the first call, and I, and and I know it's a tough judgment call for people to make, um, and anything you know short of that, I again I I would suggest you call our number. Uh, we might end up calling nine one one. You know, after talking to the a family member or to the person, um, but you know, again, it's if it if it's imminent, I would go to nine one 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 one. Not if not, I would um, try our twenty four seven line. I, I also want to promote. There's um, the state created BH Link, which is a twenty four seven um, hotline crisis triage center, and actually, it's run by Horizon Health Partnership and Kodak and Newport County Community Mental Health Center are members of that. So that's also a resource if you have questions, if there's a behavioral health issue, they, they probably would send the call out to Newport County. But I, I just think that's a resource for people if you have questions, if there's concerns, anything involving behavioral health. Um, they focus more on adults, but there is also Kids Link um, for children. But um, we can get all of this information. I mean, you're right. There are so many doors that how do you, you know, do um, the no wrong door. But I think what we, we can do is actually make sure behind the scenes, everybody has the information. So, you know, using the no wrong door number in Newport County Community Mental Health Center, if they're aware and their staff are trained on the coordinated entry system, then you should be able to call a number and the people, the professionals behind the scenes should make should be able to connect. So, so the individual isn't worrying about which door to go through. I think that's the whole point of no wrong door, but we will make sure that we connect with each other and ensure that everyone's aware of the different systems. Thanks, Michelle. So Dennis, would you, do you have anything to add? What's your experience? Well, uh, 
depends specifically what you're speaking of, <clears throat> because I, I could probably, probably talk for about 60 minutes. But uh, <clears throat> I will tell you that uh, I participated in, uh, received a certification in the youth mental health uh, first aid. <clears throat> and I will tell you, as a parent, if I would highly recommend a parent to take that course because it, they go over signs in which uh, kids or students may feel that they might not recognize when, when they're having those unfortunate uh, uh, suicidal thoughts. Um, and, and I think for, from our perspective, <clears throat> we have this background. So we see it a little bit more, it's, it's more clear to us when it's in front of us. Whereas, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. My, my father, right, who who who's who works at a, um, a, a, a factory over by in, in Richmond area, or whatever. Um, nine to five doesn't reckon this type of field at all. You know, laborer comes home wouldn't recognize signs from me if I was feeling down. He would just say, "Hey, Dennis, cut it out," you know, or whatever, and then forget about it. But reality, what he would fail to recognize is that some of my signs might be a cry for attention. So, uh, like, I, I always like to revert back to the, I forget the gentleman's name, but uh, the gentleman who, who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, right? And watch, watching, listen to his story and, and watching his <clears throat> documentary uh, through, I, I received my youth mental health uh, first aid through Newport Mental Health. So he talked about the signs that he was given his, his father or his dad, rather, um, and, he, and he was looking for attention. He never got it. So um, I feel, and I don't know how we, we can get parents to do that. The more, the more educated we can, we can be, the more we can educate our families in the topic, um, I think the more effective we could be because we talk about things that we can do. Um, that would be an immediate course of action that I would like to see. I, I thought, and, and when I was in that class, uh, I went with the dean of students, and uh, it was parents, and there were parents there, and there was a social worker there, and uh, uh, it was very informative. In, in depending what eye you look at it from, with a parent's perspective or the administrative perspective, uh, it, it's it's a little different. We we have a different perspective, but looking at it through the eyes of a parent who works nine to five, or or perhaps two jobs, comes home tired, and won't recognize. Uh, as quickly as we do what, what some of those danger signs are could be quite alarming. So um, that would be something I would recommend. And I will tell you too, we, we are very fortunate. We do have a student assistance counselor here. She's here three days a week and she's at the middle school two days a week. And I will tell you, if we had her five days a week, she would be utilized often. I mean, she's, I mean, she was, just, I, I just walked, I, I left her at a go, go get something because I'm, the people in and out of here, it's like Grand Central Station. But uh, I happened to see her. I was like, oh, I'm in a Newport Mental Health meeting right now. So she thought I needed her for something. You know? So, but, but her willingness to drop what she's doing to help is there. And uh, quite uh, a very pivotal person in, in, in this building. If we didn't have her, uh, uh, we, we'd be shortchanged. And if we had her five days in the building, and the middle school had someone for five days, there's no doubt, uh, doubt in my mind she would be busy, not for the wrong reason. I mean, she's not always dealing with stuff that's sad or, or um, heavy, but she also, you know, she's in the cafeteria socializing with kids. She, she's, you know, developing a relationship with, with kids. She's uh, outside uh, with me at dismissals waving by the kids. I mean, it's not just uh, the, the, the sad and heavy stuff. It, it, there's a lot of, she, she's involved with the positive stuff too. And I think it's important for students to see that because it makes her more approachable. Mm -hmm. You know, so and, and yeah. I think I, I think her her position is very valuable, and I don't know what she makes. I don't know that stuff, but, I, but I'm sure whatever it is, she, she's worth uh, a lot more. Harry, expect you're right. Yes, we have a question on what actually is the name of the course that he is referring to, and how New can someone get information about yeah, it? Yeah, Newport Mental uh, Mental First Aid. But Dan, can you? Yeah, it's, share? Uh, it's called Mental Health First Aid. It's sort of a national, you know, program to sort of teach, um, you know, non-mental health professionals about how to recognize and how to 
talk about when you're seeing um, or even not seeing signs and symptoms of mental health conditions. So mm -hmm. um, Sandy Ox here at Newport Mental Health is our uh, coordinator and lead on that program. So if anyone has any interest, um, you can um, contact us here at Newport Mental Health, um, particularly Sandy Ox. Okay. Yes, yeah, Sandy Ox was the instructor. She did a phenomenal job. Um, supplied good good supply of bagels and cream cheese, you know. If, yeah. And so coffee coffee was hot. Isn't there an abbreviated version, um, a right. short version too? There are some, there are different versions. There's there's sort of a more extended. There's more an abbreviated. And actually, in this training, I just talked on the zero suicide, there's yes. a little module specifically um, about asking about um, suicidality that we want to actually interject into the curriculum that I just learned great. about last week. Oh, so, great. That's so good. We're, we're very flexible in terms of, you know, some places have more or less time available to be able to, you know, sort of provide the course. We're, we're very flexible about doing it, so. And, and um, a lot of a lot of teachers have been taking this course, right? But but that's an interesting idea of uh, opening it up to parents. We, I like that idea. We'd like more <laughs> teachers to take it, to be honest with you. But I think I think from from so the difference between the teacher and the parents that if the teacher recognizes something, they can just <clears throat> there's a school psychologist down the hall, there's me, or there's someone down the hall they can go talk to immediately. Whereas the parent. I just don't know if they would know what to do immediately. I mean, we're, we're trained, right. right? So, so, so we're like hawks. As soon as something happens, we drop what we're doing. We know to react. But with the average everyday parent who doesn't have any background in this field, would they know how to react as quickly as us? You know, um, and I'll t I'll tell you the course I took with Sandy. You know, she she was a teacher. I think it was like 20, 25, 30 dollars. It was a Saturday. Um, we came with the book, very informative. It was good, good discussion. And um, I mean, I, I mean, I thought it was informative. I, I like, I, I tell everybody about it. And so um, for people who just, I mean, whatever, it's a Saturday, it's no big deal. But you know, if, 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 it, if it gives you the, the tools in order to recognize to save someone's life potentially, then the, tra the trade off isn't even, it's not even discussable. So. Great. Thanks, Dennis. I appreciate you weighing in. No problem. Um, Thank you for having me. You are here. I put, in the, I put in the chat, but I seem to be only a private to Terry chat. Oh. Um, but um, Newport Community School also runs mental health first aid through the adult learning program. Oh, good. And anybody that's opened up to anybody, Laura? Yes. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I, I have been sharing those in those private inform that private information into the chat just so you know thanks thank you thank you both thanks donna ray did ray i know you i think you i saw something from um in the chat from you and i think you had a question that you submitted too i don't know if we've touched on it yet I know uh, you, you know you, the question was answered earlier what i was just referring to is that through the newport county prevention coalition We've done a lot of work with the faith communities in, in Newport County and offered that mental health training, which many of us in the community prevention coalitions have taken as well. And that training was absolutely excellent. Because the, many of the faith leaders said to us, we asked them, what is the thing that we can give you that you, would, that you feel is most pressing? They said to us, we need a better understanding of what the mental health issues really are because we're seeing more issues with the people coming to them for guidance. And uh, many of them took that training and uh, we've developed uh, a strong relationship with the Quinnick Island Clergy Association as well as other faith organizations that don't necessarily participate in that to be able to contact the local community prevention coalitions because many of the coalitions have the faith community on those coalitions actively involved participating in. So that's a whole nother network that's just waiting to have this information about where to send somebody easily. Um, and we're lucky to have that here in Newport County as well. And that's because of what has been said today, the cooperation 
with all the different agencies that we have been talking about for the last 25 years. So um, I'm glad that, and I know from our work with you in Portsmouth, you know, you've been involved, actively involved with this for years. So as I, I think Linda was talking about this earlier, and you've heard it from me for years, we need the support of legislators to get us funding so we can do the work that we can do. So um, I appreciate your efforts here a great deal because I know that you're sincere in what you're doing and it's appreciated. Thanks. Thanks, Harry. Yes. We've been asked if Dennis would say um, what his title is and who he represents. I think you're from yeah. the high school. Yeah, Middletown High School assistant principal. And I'm also uh, uh, represent uh, Middletown Public Schools on the Middletown Prevention Coalition. Also friend of Rebecca Elwell. <laughs> I, I was on the Tyranny Prevention Coalition uh, before, but then I made the switch over to Middletown. And um, so I'm, I'm a, uh, in fact, we got, a, we got a Middletown Prevention Coalition this Thursday at six o'clock, fourth Thursday of every month. Uh, we've been Zooming them uh, because of obvious reasons, but they are open to the public. So if anybody's interested in uh, participating or listening to a meeting, uh, you can email me my uh, uh, email address is on the website, D-S-O-A-R-E-S -E at M-P-S-R-I.net. What I can do is I can connect you with Lori Vitarosa and she'll, she can send you the, the Zoom link. Or Pastor um, Lori, she's our, uh, our uh, the coalition secretary. So, Thank you, Dennis. Thanks. You're welcome. I, I, I think I've seen on Twitter too when those yep, meetings yep. are coming up. Yep. Yes. And I see we have Esther here from the Portsmouth Prevention Coalition. Do you want to share when, when your meetings are? I, I know I'm on your email list, but. Yes. Hi, Terry. Thank you. Hi. We have rescheduled our meeting for November. It's going to be November 18th, um, but they're usually um, the second Tuesday of every month. And are yours are in the morning, right? Yes, they're are from 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. Okay. So we're meeting via Zoom still. Great. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Does anybody else this morning have um, a question or a comment? I want to thank you all again for joining us. Is that John? John Brooks, go ahead. You got the floor. Unmute yourself. <laughs> the story of our lives, unmute. <laughs> I, I can't can, unmute him. You can't. No. In the lower left-hand corner of your screen, that's where it is on my. Brilliant. There you yeah, go. Thank you very much. Right. All right, Excellent. Terry. Thank you for organizing this. As I look at the group here today, you know, you've got SAMHSA, Buddha, and schools, and Newport Mental Health, and wonderful Dan, who's now picking up another chapter in his very extensive life. And I'm struck by several things that, from a from a delegate or representative point of view, you know, maybe an opportunity. First and foremost, uh, I'm fascinated by the number of people in this organization that are seeking each other's phone numbers and contact information. Um, and I, I don't know if this is a state or whether it's a Newport County issue. You know, we have 82,000 citizens in Newport County. And I think Newport Mental Health is probably dealing with about 2,600 operating cases. And if you added up all the cases that I'm looking at on the screen from Linda's group, which has done wonderful work to you know, others in, in our county, the one thing that I do see is Newport County itself is small. It's a microcosm. It's a wonderful place to run an experiment that enables others in the state to see that certain programs and opportunities can be run successfully. You know, we, we have a very large shortage of uh, money, you know, in the state. If anybody's questioning that, just go out and have dinner with Marvin and Cheryl, and you'll end up uh, understanding that life is short uh, and they don't know where to turn. So I, I would say, as I listened today, you know, the, the, the topics hit were, you know, our uh, suicide, you know, our substance abuse, and are we treating it early or are we treating it late? Uh, we have family issues for early education. Um, you know, by the time kids are in school, is it too late? 
you know, it's it's a housing issue, and certainly Jamie the Frap the Forest worked his rear end and his tail off to try to make Motel Six uh, an accommodating opportunity for everybody. But then I, I I worry a little bit that we've got so many programs for no wrong door and open access that maybe we might not necessarily be successful. And that somewhere in here amongst this august group of, of folks, um, maybe we pick a few that are our test case, not to say that all aren't necessary, but maybe we try to pick a few cross collateral organizations that will then get funded on a longer term basis. Uh, I think the, the, the comment made earlier, you know, we get funded for a year and then the program stops. We get funded for the year, the program gets stopped. You know, it's a license for disaster as a citizen, as a, as a taxpayer, as a representative, not a representative of the state, but I live here. Um, and I'm certainly very committed to mental health, but I, I just sort of sense that we're missing the opportunity to not only deal with and treat the symptoms, but put together a very detailed financial plan that can be sold up to committee, that can then be executed and implemented by Rebecca and, and per perhaps by the overall Newport Coalition. Not sure where it gets executed, but I do get a sense that we have a lot of good opportunities. We have a lot of wonderful programs, but I just, I get concerned when even you guys have a hard time figuring out who you are. What are the parents and what are the kids? You know, how do they get to that? And I remember reading that if we address children and families very early on and we get to their mental health issues, that ultimately maybe in 10 or 15 years, we'll see the benefit of that in lower medical costs um, and lower uh, operating costs, you know, not only for the state, you know, but if we look at it on a national basis, mm -hmm. and maybe we need a, a departure point to make these programs meaningful. And at the end of the day, everybody is unfortunately now has to be driven at the state level um, and at the federal level, and I've asked David Cicilline and and, uh, and Sheldon and, and others, you know, what what are their interests? And each person has an interest, but maybe if we have a focal point that says if we can measure success and execute, we can bring down suicide, right? Maybe if we can measure success in early children's and families, that the that the colleges that ultimately get our kids and the high schools and the middle school kids, maybe that sensitivity will be there and we'll be able to achieve something meaningful rather than patching and adding basically lots of costs. And I'm not against you know funding and grants. What I am against is not necessarily having a plan to use that money so that ultimately all of these fine organizations succeed. And that, that as, a rep, as a citizen, is what I would share in a 70, num, number 72 up there. You know, may you wish good things for you on November 2nd, uh, but I really do wish good things for our children in our state. Thank you for that opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, John. Michelle, do you, what do you, do you, can, do you have a comment on that? <laughs> Since you're the yeah. state, <laughs> you're my liaison to the state. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it's one of the reasons we created BH Link um, to have a central point for families and individuals to to call into. And then again, it's the behind the scenes connection to whether it's the local reentry council, the prevention coalition, the um, reentry council. Yeah, the prevention coalition. I was about. I meant to right. say center, but the reentry council is also something that could be part of it. So I think that we probably need to work behind the scenes to make it seamless for individuals using the system. And I'm sure through the No Wrong Door grant, that's one of the um, main objectives. So this is my first entree into, into the No Wrong Door um, grant that, that Newport County received. So I'm, I'm really grateful that Jamie invited me. So I think working with the team um, from the state level, we can assist. So would, would the idea, um, Rebecca, be that the, the grant funds are used to stand up the infrastructure and then, then it would become um, 
maybe self-supporting through state funding or do we have to go back out for another grant? How, how do you foresee the long range funding to once you get things up and running? And, and my other question, um, slightly related, is if a parent calls BH Link or Kids Link um, and they're from Aquinnick Island, do they end up at this coalition? Do they, is that where they get steered to this? So for the first question, um, in terms of funding, the funding that we have currently is to stand up this project. Um, we have deliverables that need to be met and an infrastructure that needs to be built um, and a broad sense of how we want to create um, continuing groups that will meet the clinical leaders from all of the partner organizations will continue to meet. And then there is a community council that will be built with um, the CEOs, basically the highest levels of the partner organizations, but 51% of that uh, group that will be meeting will be uh, citizens from the community and particularly um, folks who have been clients in the behavioral health system. So that will be sort of the governance type of um, organization because what we really want to be able to do is have folks with real decision-making powers. So that's sort of the, the higher level administrators of the agencies, but also incorporating the voice of the folks that are using the services and have been the recipient of services either for themselves or for their families. So that sort of piece will sustain the ongoing actions and will direct the ongoing actions of the No Wrong Door system. Um, for the foreseeable future, my guess is that we're going to be relying on grant funding. Um, I feel like my so much of my time is spent chasing grant funds. Um, it's it's I, I actually like it. It's necessary, but it is incredibly time consuming, and it takes away from some of the hands on work that would really benefit the lives of the folks that we're supposed to be supporting. Um, it's, you know, you got to do it. It's the only way. I don't, I don't want to be pessimistic. I don't see a windfall of state funding coming our way anytime soon to do this, uh, but we're certainly open to that. Um, and then the BH Link piece. So BH Link is open 24 hours a day. Um, phone calls, it's a, there's also a walk-in. It's located in East Providence. Um, I, so people can actually go there and get services no matter what time of the day it is, I believe. Michelle could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but also if there is a, so if someone's calling in and there is a, a more local uh, access, I believe they could be rerouted to that local access. So for example, Newport Mental Health has their 24 hour access hub. Um, somebody coming calling from Middletown, for, for example, could be rerouted to Newport Mental Health. But it's the, I think the most important piece for BH Link is that it's, it's advertised, it's highly um, visible to folks who are, you know, who are looking for services. And it is somebody who's going to answer the phone. It came slightly in advance of Newport Mental Health's 24 hour access. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a chicken and an egg thing. Um, we also would want to promote the more local just because people have a connection to Newport Mental Health. It's not an either or, it's sort of an and. Um, yeah. The two opportunities to get support, we can't have enough of that. Um, and to John's point, I think it's really, it's really apt. It sounds like alphabet soup. Everybody's got you know a, a number, an access point of this or that. Um, I will say that most of us know what those access points are, but I'm not at all convinced that we're communicating that as effectively and clearly as we need to for the community. Because, yep. um, you know, I, I wanted to chime in before and say we have a resource, uh, a you know, a, a P PDF file of resources. Um, at the very top of that is the BH Link and Newport Mental Health. 24-hour um, access, and then there's additional uh, resources. That would be a full-time job to kind of keep that updated. Mm -hmm. So it's not the most efficient and effective way. It's up to this point, 
um, it's been the best that we could uh, derive so that people had those phone numbers in one spot. Um, but I think that's the continuing challenge is how do we, in as few resources or as few numbers as possible, communicate to people um, where how to best access services? It's, I think it's the challenge of the day. The team. I think yes. this is Linda Terry, if I may, I'll be yeah. quick. I just noticed the time. Um, I think to speak to what John said as well, um, that's really, you know, in my evolution of my profession, where I've landed as an advocate for behavioral health services, and in particular, over the last several years, um, uh, opioid treatment, is that we have to go back to using the money um, uh, in an efficient and effective way. Those are the two key words. So how do we do that? You know, and I think that, that again, we have to look at collaboration, not just between providers, but collaboration between levels of decision-making in the state so that the governor's office, so that the state house, so that our oversight departments, like what Michelle is representing, are working with the providers and the recipients of care. All five levels need to come together and work together and plan um, so, that, so that we're not wasting dollars. We're not getting dollars and someone saying, you have three months to get this up, then you get to run it for nine months and then you're done at the end of two because you need a month to put the report in. Um, it's, and that's a real case, you know, and everybody's doing the best they can but everybody's doing the best they can in their own offices. We really need, we need political will to collaborate, to use the funds we have. And we have to start being respected in terms of the field. Behavioral health has to be important enough to our lawmakers and our governor's office. It has to be important enough so that it becomes part of a budget. Um, because the grant to grant, you know, Rebecca was quite gracious. Uh, I've spent far too much of my life and my passion being a professional beggar. And I think that um, we really do need, if what everybody says is true, there should be political will. But all we have to do is look at what gets passed. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I want to thank you all again for uh, joining the conversation. Does um, we're coming up to the end of our session. It's like two minutes to 10. Um, uh, feel free to email me with questions and I could help field them to the attendees or um, I guess uh, uh, who's the main point of contact from the people represented this morning on our panel. And I wanna thank the panel too for um, attending. If somebody has a question specific to the work of the um, No Wrong Door policy and all, who should they, if they want to email a question, who should they get to? You, Rebecca, or somebody? They could absolutely send it to me. And if it's something um, specific to one of our partner agencies, I will forward it on to them. But I'm happy to be sort of the clearinghouse right. for that. OK, thank Rebecca, you. Rebecca, can you put your email in the chat, please? I sure can. Yes. Um, is Ed on the, Ed? Are you on the line? Can we hear you now? I am, and I just want to Great. say thank you to this fantastic panel, uh, to the community members that are engaged in this. Um, hope it's just the beginning, and we'll all continue the good work ahead. Great. Um, there's. Uh, I just saw something pop up in the chat um, about the various coalition members uh, getting together to meet once in a while. Does that happen? Um, do you guys? So each community coalition, Portsmouth, Middletown, Newport, Tiverton, Little Compton, they each host a monthly meeting in their communities. Of course, now everything's virtual, but it's for their specific communities. Right. Um, each one has their own schedule. And I know that people are putting that in the chat. Right. Newport County Regional Coalition also meets on a monthly basis virtually now. Um, it, when we meet in person, it's at the Brown House on Linden Lane in Portsmouth. Um, we meet, I think it's the third month, uh, third Tuesday of every month. They just met yesterday. Um, and P our, our community members are always welcome to participate in that. And they can get more information if they send me their just an email request. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question that was in the chat. And thank you again. I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, this is a this was a really um, there's a lot of work here. <laughs> And I appreciate all the work you're doing. And I got the message loud and clear. <laughs> well, and uh, Terry, I'll just, yes. Uh, yes. Look, I, I want to also just call you know out the work that you've done too specifically. And um, I think it's good for folks to know. Uh, for the first time in recent memory, Newport Mental Health received uh, a state legislative grant, and Terry went to bat for us on that. So that is direct state support that. Um, so Terry, thank you for bringing those funds back to the district, and for making that possible uh, to, to you know to just shine a light on it and make this conversation possible. Thanks, thank you, Ed. Thank you. My pleasure. And so with that, I guess we'll say good day. I hope everybody has a great day today. It's a little dreary out there, but um, thanks again for being here and. Um, we will see you all soon. <laughs>